Well, uh, hello, uh, Tim here, uh, incompetent YouTuber and sort of okay portrait photographer, uh, maybe. Um, incompetent YouTuber, yeah, I just made a <laughs> video where I like, ranted away for, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure, 10 minutes or so, and um, went to check it and found, of course, I had not switched live view on when I pressed the red recording button. So uh, uh, <laughs> here we go again. Um, I talked about my latest purchase, the Sekonic L478 last time round in the blank video. So um, I've kind of uh, remember what I said about that. So uh, let's start with that one, shall we? Um, and then I'll also talk about the old SB20 and um, uh, an old film thing, and also how you can do a surprising thing of uh, using old sync cords um, uh, to do HSS flash, although not TTL. And then I'll just have a talk about the pressure to buy new stuff and uh, my uh, desire to resist it and uh, recommend that others do. So let's start with the um, 478 meter here. Um, I had a an L358 meter before, which is the, the kind of skinny silver one um, that uh, was extremely popular with the pros. Um, Daniel Norton had one of those. Um, I'm a Daniel Norton fan. Here's my badge. Hello, Daniel Norton. He's not going to watch this. Um, yeah, the L358 meter, I like to have certainly uh, meters every time I do like flash photography um, uh, with strobes in the studio, just because it, you know, you get it right straight away and you can do all your ratios nice and easily and stuff. Um, you don't have to have it. You can use, uh, you know, the back of the camera and um, and your histogram and things. But uh, it's 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 good. Um, I went to a shoot and didn't use a meter um, on the recommendation of the pro running the shoot. And um, I fucked up and uh, I had some underexposed pics. Um, which I was luckily able to rescue, but I shall be taking this nice new easy to read meter next time. So why did I get this one and uh, and sell on my 358, which was perfectly good? Um, reason is um, my eyesight ain't what it used to be. There's some very tiny numbers on that, uh, on, the, on the old uh, thing, the ISO and various other things. I was like squinting at those, uh, reaching for powerful reading glasses to see and um, and I and uh, these things are now just about affordable, so I thought I'll get one of these and sell and go against it. So I've got this. It's got a nice big. Uh, I haven't got this fancy focus, so I can't bring it for close and show you. But nice big sort of um, camera phone style bright display. Everything's super easy to do on it, and um, and it's just good for an old man like me with um, crappy eyesight and. Uh, uh, there you go. So that's that's the 478. Um, uh, it's just uh, more convenience and um, I like it. Let's get rid of that. Let's briefly talk about, uh, maybe not so briefly, let's talk about the SB20. Now this is a um, this is a, a TTL flash from the film era, um, from the mid 80s, around the Nikon sort of 501 f 501 f 601 sort of era um, does TTL on those cameras but the older film TTL things do not do TTL on modern digitals so if you pop this on a d3 or um, you know d4 d whatever you know um, it is a uh, uh, don't you put it in the TTL setting, you'll just get an error, it won't work. Uh, there are three settings, the little slider switch here, manual, auto, and uh, TTL. Now, uh, manual focus, uh, this thing's got like a five stop range of uh, full power to 1 16th. Uh, that sort of explains itself here. You've got a little distance calculator scale on here, so you can kind of work out in manual uh, what you're gonna do. Uh, if you know how to do that kind of stuff, uh, which I won't explain here, but uh, 
but you've got a five stop manual flash here. Um, but you can also use the auto setting here, which I think is the middle setting. And um, there you can set aperture, set ISO, and sort of shoot within the range it recommends. And it will give you auto. And it's obviously not doing that from TTL because it doesn't TTL connect with a modern digital um, like it used to on the film camera. But what it has got is it has its own little light reader here. So it's using that. So it's not going to be as accurate as your TTL stuff. But you can put your modern digital Nikon in manual, put this on there, put it in auto, uh, follow their settings and uh, actually get auto uh, flash, uh, which isn't necessarily going to be tremendously accurate, but it will be, it does work. And uh, that's quite a surprise. Um, yeah. So I'll just say that this is a really nicely made thing. You know, uh, you know, the stuff you see today that costs vastly more, you can't imagine it surviving like this sort of super well made kit from the 80s. Um, Nikon Flash is particularly well known for um, being beautifully built and uh, this thing still works um, absolutely fine. There you go, some, some flashes. Let's rack it up full power and uh, see, oh, no, no, it's, <laughs> this is one of these things where I just need to see a bit closer what I'm doing. Aha, yes, here we go. Full power flash, pow. Um, it works, uh, that's good. Okay, so that's that little flash uh, chatted about. And now the weird thing about doing HSS. Let me say that I saw this video with a guy shooting a model on a beach and doing a uh, high speed sync flash. And I kind of did a double take because he had two uh, TTL cords um, chained together. Now, the Nikon modern TTL digital cord for flash is this thing, which is the SC29. And uh, you cannot chain these things together. So I looked at this and I thought, do you know, I think that's the old SC17 TTL cords from um, the film era. And here we go, here's two of those. Oops, here we go. SC17 cords, and you can chain those together. And I think that's what it is. And I thought to myself, well, but those old film SC17 cords, they don't do TTL with modern digital. And that's true. But the surprising conclusion I came to from seeing this video is, well, they must do HSS. And I tested it and they do. So if you put your camera in, um, in manual mode and, uh, and then set the shutter speed in um, HSS and put, uh, the crucial thing is, it won't do it with like these flashes, but if you put in like an SB800, SB900, SB on a pair of chained SC17s and uh, set the camera to um, HSS, yes, <laughs> they will actually do it. I, you surprise the hell out of me. Um, so in theory, you can take an SB800, SB900, whatever, uh, a little bit off camera, a couple of meters off camera with this and, um, and uh, get HSS. Now, you're probably not going to kill the sun in a bright lighting situation with a single flash. But what you can do is utilize the shutter speed to give you a nice sharp eye and, uh, you know, uh, a, a more open aperture. And, um, and get a little bit of fill in um, HSS with that high shutter speed. So there you go. That's a, a thing I didn't know before. Um, but... Uh, realized from seeing this video i don't i've never seen actually the in fact the guy who made the video never actually discussed the aspect of using an old uh, old sync cords to do hss with digitals and it occurred to me i've never seen it discussed before but 
seeing his video, I realised it was doable. So let's end there, and uh, we'll end this topic there, and then I'll just talk about the modern camera industry. Here we go. So here's one of my cameras I've got. But this one is a, a 2008 D3X now. All the kind of modern YouTubers are going to tell you that uh, you need a fancy camera uh, with a tremendous uh, eye-finding ability and, um, and uh, tremendous tracking ability and a huge number of frames a second and uh, all that kind of stuff. Well, maybe in some applications you do. But if you're just a kind of average photographer like me that likes to shoot people and portraits and things, um, or landscapes, you don't need all that modern stuff that they're trying to sell you for thousands of quid. Um, let me see, uh, the new Nikon Z9 that everybody's raving about, um, a fabulous thing, 45 megapixel sensor, huge number of frames a second, so the eye finding and tracking. Um, you know, are you telling me that you, as a portrait photographer, can't place a focus point on someone's eye and press the button? Uh, clearly you can. Uh, imagine uh, back in the 80s, uh, Steve McCurry and his famous Afghan girl picture. Uh, uh, probably the most famous, one of the most famous uh, uh, portraits uh, people talk about. Now that was taken on a, um, oh I don't know, a Nikon FE, um, Nikon F2, something along those lines, Nikon F3 perhaps. Um, with a manual focus um, Nikkor 105 f2.5 AI AIS maybe even a non AI lens who knows um, he got the little split screen prism in the middle of the uh, viewfinder he put it on the eye he matched up the two parts of the prism reframed and uh, took his uh, world world famous portrait. Now, uh, if that could be done uh, back then by a competent photographer, um, you know, something like this from 2008 uh, with several focus points that you can put on the eye and it will instantly jump onto them. I mean, that's, that's sort of like, uh, you know, luxury assistance. Uh, you know, it's enough to do the job, um, enough to do um, a great job. And um, so, you know, do you need uh, a five and a half thousand dollar um, Z9? Do you need a seven, eight thousand dollar Sony A1? Do you need a three and a half thousand dollar Canon R5 or R6, do you need a $2,000 uh, Nikon Z6 II? Well, nice things to have maybe, but here we go. This camera, which is a 24 megapixel um, multiple auto-focusing camera with admittedly rather poor ISO capability but you know if you're taking portraits then uh, this or an original D3 um, a Canon 5D Mark II perhaps um, a 6D or something like that they will take extremely nice portraits um, and uh, you know they're I mean this thing I think this cost me 650 quid UK <laughs> when I got this I mean, compare that with a, a five and a half thousand uh, dollar Nikon Z9. Well, uh, would I like a five and a half thousand dollar Nikon Z9? Yeah, I would. Um, am I going to pay that to take portraits? Do I need to pay that to pay to take portraits? I think not. So uh, that's really my my uh, theme here that. We, have, we now live in a world, it's almost like being in the matrix, you're kind of surrounded 24-7 uh, 
advertising come in, you put in a YouTube video, you know, the adverts instantly come up, interrupt, get in your face. Everywhere you look, TV, you want to watch, I was watching the Tour de France, you know, uh, the adverts come on every few minutes, throwing stuff in your face. Everywhere you go, they are trying to control your mind and uh, make you throw away your existing capital and uh, pay their money to replace it with new capital. Um, and you don't need to do that. You can just say, no, I'm in control of uh, my photographic equipment and uh, you know I don't need a camera that finds the eye for me and uh, virtually wipes my arse and uh, makes tea and uh, you know uh, takes away all the all the processes of photography from me and uh, kind of makes me into a kind of like a kind of a dumb dependent um, so I'm getting a bit carried away here aren't I uh, if you've been um, subscribing you subscribe to my uh, channel recently that's very kind of you um, I don't ask people to do it and um, and I don't make videos very often so uh, so uh, that's good of you and uh, that's great uh, and uh, I usually answer uh, any uh, queries that I have so uh, you ask something I will do my best to uh, reply and answer um, shall we call that a day yes I think we will cheerio